So, peer-to-peer -peer connectivity on iOS. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Tim Raphael. Um, I presented here last year, and for those with eagle eyes, they'll notice that I have changed universities. I was at Murdoch, I'm now at EWA. I'm doing a master's in software engineering. So, I don't know why I'm using Keynote Remote, because I'm sitting right in front of my laptop. Anyway, um, some of the best apps currently on the store are games. People love them, they're popular, they're great to play, they're a lot of fun. Some of the best games involve multiple people. Um, this is probably one of the most uh, interesting games and probably one of the most different ones I've found, Space Team, for those that haven't played it, along with all these others. These all encourage people to work together and play together. Um, Space Team is great because you sit around in a group of people and you work together. It's not a competition, but it's a collaborative um, activity where you work towards a goal. Um, the one thing that these all have in common is that they require inter-device connectivity. Not necessarily over the internet, but within a short range. Up till now, um, a lot of the frameworks that we've had to use for this have evolved around Game Center and particularly the Bluetooth integration that Game Center has um, provided us with their um, Bluetooth frameworks. That's Anvil number one, for those counting. Um, the other thing we've had to use is CF networking. Um, the CF net service, all the Bonjour APIs, sockets, and core Bluetooth, which I've really only worked with recently. Um, cool framework, but there's a lot in there, and it's not simple, if you like. So. For games, GameKit is a great option because it allows you to quickly and easily pair Bluetooth devices and will allow communication, it's not strictly pairing, but allow communication between these devices. In the case of Space Team, as I said before, you're working together, messages are getting passed between the devices um, in the form of instructions. And you've got to communicate that to your other players and they've got to push the buttons or turn the dials or whatever the instruction says. So it's part human communication part device communication, which is really, really quite cool. Um, so frameworks we've had to use up till now, CFNet service. This one is a nice framework that allows you to control a Bonjour service. For those that don't know what Bonjour is, it's Apple have put some nice things on top of DNS. So this is basically a multicast slash broadcast DNS where you can publish a service name and devices can connect to that service and gain information about the service. So first things first, you publish the service, you specify a name and a domain. Uh, that domain fits within the DNS realm. And you set up a delegate for all these, uh, there's half a dozen callbacks you've got to listen for, whether it's successful or not. Um, if devices have heard the publication, if the publication uh, worked, if there was DNS issues, etc. Um, you then set up a browser. And so that browser, you give the same service name, the same domain, you set up the delegate, there's another half a dozen methods for listing the various states on that. Um, you also have to deal with name resolution, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, and for communication, you've actually got to set up a socket. Um, so you use CF networking and you create a C type socket. Um, so to connect the service, you do your IP, IP and DNS um, lookup. So sockets, you do need to do a DNS resolution because you can only can set up a socket on an IP address on a DNS, so you've got on a DNS name. Uh, so you've got to do that resolution, that's another step to do. Once you set up your socket and you've got it all running, you need to monitor it, keep, keep the socket alive, make sure the um, service hasn't dropped off and persisting a Bonjour service, say a phone call comes in, uh, you need to somehow save that state, bring it back when the user resumes, all of that. So there are a lot of things you need to do to keep this um, peer-to-peer -peer communication consistent and nice. There's a lot of things to think about. So that's CF networking, and that's for your Wi-Fi. That was for Wi-Fi. GameKit actually gives you an abstraction over core Bluetooth. I'm not gonna dive into core Bluetooth. This is by far the easiest way of getting a quick peer-to-peer -peer Bluetooth session up and running. Well, up till now. Uh, GameKit. GameKit gives you a GK session object, which you can use and it allows you to track the session. Apple also gives you this GK Peer Picker View Controller, which is great because it's a out-of-the-box view controller. It'll show your nearby Bluetooth peers. You can click on them and you can hit connect and all really good. 
it allows you to send and receive NS data objects for in-game communication, for sending messages and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, one, it's Bluetooth. So it's great. It's a great near-field communication. All devices have it. It's, it works. But it's a little on the slow side. Bluetooth isn't great if you want to try and send large NS data blocks. Uh, say you want to send images or other resources or stream video, you're not going to have the best experience. Um, in terms of, yeah, what about streaming media? You can stream over sockets using CF networking with Wi-Fi. That's great, but it, it sucks because it's sockets. Um, what about secure communication? Uh, say you want to encrypt a session. Yes, you could grab your NS data block, uh, run it through an encryption algorithm, run some, some kind of HTTPS server you like, if you like, or some kind of SSL between your sockets. You could do all that, but a lot of code and it's not easy. So up until now, these have been the sort of mishmash of ways in which you get inter-device communication working. Most people will have gone for one or the other, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, rather than having to deal with both sets of frameworks. But in iOS 7, and number two, we now get this lovely framework called multi-peer connectivity. This feels like AirDrop in terms of the ease of use, but it gives you quite a lot of flexibility. This was introduced, and particularly to me, at WWDC this year, which I was lucky to attend. And so a lot of this content has come out of the slides and Apple documentation. Um, unfortunately, there's no programming guide for this yet which is a brilliant document for any sort of large set of Apple frameworks. Um, we've just got the class references for now. But according to some of the Apple forums, that document's on the way. Also, I had to um, be a little bit careful about how I worded the presentation um, description and stuff because this wasn't technically released when I was putting this presentation together, but we're all good now. We're all good now. So the way this multi-peer connectivity framework works, you've got an advertiser. So an advertiser is the publisher of a service, the host node, if you like. But for all intents and purposes, all nodes in the, in the network are basically equal, equal. But you've got to advertise a service. You then set up a browser. That browser discovers to the service and sends a connection request or an invite request to the advertiser. Once the advertiser accepts that, you get connectivity. Yay. It's as simple as that. No sockets, no DNS, it's so easy. The best thing about it is it runs over both technologies. If you publish a service, it will be published over both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth if both technologies are available. If only one, it'll be published on that one. Really, really nice. It, you send data the same way, no matter what technology. You can query which type of technology you're using um, but you don't have any input into what it uses. So in terms of ease of use, particularly for developers, straightforward. You don't have to prompt users to say, turn on your Wi-Fi or turn on your Bluetooth. You just get a notification saying this, the developer will get a callback saying this isn't, I can't do this, it failed because. And you look at that in one of the areas. Then you can present the user and say, you need to be connected to Wi-Fi, you need to be connected to Bluetooth. But you don't need to worry about which technology the user is using. So, there are three types of ways you can send data over this new multi-peer connectivity framework. The first of which is messages. Now, a message is simply an NS data block which you send statelessly to the other peer or to a set of peers. Messages allows a one-to-many data communication so you can effectively broadcast. You can also um, send it to just one peer if you want. Messages work best when the data has a finite start point and a finite end point. So you know exactly how much data. For data that you don't know exactly how much, streaming works. So this leverages the NS input stream and the NS output stream classes, which are great. You can put any objects onto that. It'll serialize them, it'll send them off. All you need to do is open up a connection request and say, I want to send this stream, away you go. And thirdly, you've got resources. Um, according to this little icon that I grabbed off Apple, there are references at the end, um, you can send HTTP documents, you can send text documents and other local file documents or URLs from the web. 
So you could specify HTTP google.com and it'll wget that effectively and send that to the other device. Um, not a lot of documentation on exactly what type of files you can send. In my playing around with resources, um, it wouldn't accept certain file extensions and it'd just give you a file unsupported. So I'm waiting for some more documentation on that. Um, I'll add comments to the um, presentation slides on the AEC website when I know more. So um, I like code, so let's let's get into it. Um, so code time. So the first thing you do when you want to want to set up a session is you need a peer ID. This is an MC peer ID. Uh, the peer ID is used to identify you as the device. So if you, even if you're doing a, a one to many, you still have to have a peer ID. Uh, so firstly, I import the framework and I create a, a, an instance variable for storing my MC peer ID, and I initialize the peer ID with a display name. Now that can be any string. In this case, I've just used the UI device's name, which people are familiar with. It'll show up in the browsers, and users are familiar with it. They know Jan's iPhone, Tim's iPhone, whatever. So that's the first thing you do. Once you've done that, you need a session. Now, a session is probably the central object that is used throughout this communication. It handles uh, sending of resources, messages, and streams, as well as giving you the delegate callbacks to receive them. So you set up a session, and you initialize it with your peer, because a session also stores the connected peers. So for you to initialize a session and publish a service, you need to be part of that session. So you, you give it yourself, uh, your peer ID, and you set yourself as the delegate so you can receive those callbacks. There are, actually, there are two ways you can advertise a service. Um, there's the MC Advertiser Assistant, which I'm showing you now, and then there's a slightly different way a bit further on where you can do the whole, progress, the whole process programmatically. I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, to set up a nice Advertiser Assistant, uh, you specify a service type. Now, I tend to find the service type is not the best name variable because it is an identifier for your service. Uh, what you probably should be doing, which I'm not, is using the bonjour standard of protocol dot underscore your service name. So that's probably what I should have done here. So um, do as I say, not do as I do. Um, but basically you set up your assistant, you give it your session and your service type. And so then it will start advertising that service when you call start. The one thing that Bonjour can do, which is really nice, is it gives you this opportunity to do discovery info. So this discovery info is an NS dictionary of very limited size. You could only put two or three things in. I think the networking limit is about less than a K. So you can put information in there that will um, tell you more about your service when it's being advertised. So people don't need to connect to it to get more information. So say you've got a game and your user wants to connect with someone else and you want to, I don't know, display a user's status or what level they are. You can say, okay, this user is advertising to connect and their, their name is this and they're on this level. So you could put a nice tiny little int and a number into a dictionary and advertise that with a service, which is really quite nice. A little bit of extra information you can provide. So once you've got the advertiser set up, you then need to set up a browser. The advertiser browser is what makes this work. And just as a side point, Apple suggests as soon as you launch the app, start advertising. Even if you know that it might not be users browsing, if you start advertising as soon as you launch up, when a user starts browsing, it'll be there. It makes for a much nicer user experience. And the user doesn't have to go in and say, um, start advertising or make me discoverable or something like that. Just do it. It's much, much easier. For the browsing, much like GameKit, Apple provides you with a nice MC browser view controller. This is an iOS 7 standard app style view controller, which discovers nearby peers, given a session ID, and it handles all the accept and decline invite for you. It'll also show you the connected peers. Uh, so to set up this one, you um, initialize a view controller, pass it your session and your session type, set yourself as the delegate, and then present the view controller. Really, really simple. Everything is stored in that session 
in that session object, so it uses that to uh, populate the view controller. Session state. Sessions have a state for each peer. So within a session, there's a peers array, and you can iterate through the peers stored in that session. The peers will have a particular state, whether they're connected, not connected, or connecting. Um, so you can query this state on the session and update local variables or um, check the status of something before you try and send, because you're going to error out if you try and send to a peer that's not connected or to a session that's not connected. So it's best to do this first. Um, you've got an enum of states you can check. So let's actually start sending some stuff. So sending messages, um, I'm just going to send a string here. So we're going to send hello world, and I'm going to get my connected peers, which I said are stored in the session. So an NS array of peers, get my session.connectedPeers. Um, I'll initialize an error, and then you simply say my session send data. And then I encode the NS string down to a NS data using the UTF-8 string encoding. I specify the array for the peers, and I give it a mode. Now there are two modes. Anyone familiar with networking will know that MC session send data reliable uh, indicates a TCP type connection where you're guaranteed that the data will get there. There's also MC session send data unreliable, which is a UDP type connection. Apple recommends that for game or app critical data, you use uh, data reliable, but for real time type data, so streaming video images, um, the unreliable is preferred because if you receive an, say a streamed audio packet out of sequence, it's not going to make it's not going to be much use to you because you can't um, recreate the data or replay it to the user or anything like that. So that's will also give you a slight performance increase as well using the unreliable method. But for anything uh, critical, use the acknowledgement because I want want my string to be sent and I want to make sure that it gets there. I, I don't really care um, if it arrives. Um, I do care if it arrives out of order, so I want my string to be correct, so I send it reliably. So on the other end, the receiving session object of the other, other device will get a delegate callback from the session, which is session did receive data from peer. Then basically, you get a data message uh, in the form of an NS data. In this case, I turn it back into a string and I print it to the console. Straightforward. You'll notice here that with these messages, you don't have any kind of cancellation method. You also don't have any indicator of progress. You also don't have any kind of completion handler. So messages are generally meant to be quite small amounts of data that you don't have to monitor. So you don't want to try and uh, encode a UI image down into an NS data and attempt to send that. Although the send method is asynchronous, you can't cancel it and you can't monitor its progress. So you can't give the user any feedback. Um, you could set a spinner while uh, the other end is waiting, but that's just annoying. Um, so messages is great for small, quick amounts of data. If you wanted to send bigger things, files, URLs, that kind of thing, the resources is a much better option. Um, again, you get your array of connected peers and I get a, uh, a path to the documents directory where I've stored my awesome resource.dat. That's a Windows data format, I know. Um, then you can send it to one peer. You can't do one to many with resources. You can send it to one peer. So if you want to send it to multiple, you just have to do one serially, one after the other, with a for loop, for example. So you turn your NS string into a URL and then give your URL to um, your my session with the send resource at URL call. You specify your resource, you give it a unique identifier, and you specify which peer you want to send it to. And then you've got a nice completion handler, which will tell you using the NS error whether it was um, successful or not. The error will be nil if it's successful, and it will have contents if it's unsuccessful. The send resource at URL method also returns an NS progress. Now you can query the NS progress with 
com fraction completed, dot fraction completed, to find out how much of the resource has been sent. In terms of receiving them, it's the same deal. You've got two delegate methods on the session. You will get called did start receiving resource with name. When you start to receive a resource, I believe this only gets called once. Um, you get your resource name, which is that unique identifier for the resource. You get the peer that it's coming from, and you get returned a uh, similar reference to the NS progress. So you can then store that in a um, instance variable and provide user feedback that way. And then when the file is completed, you're given another call from did finish receiving resource with name. Again, that same unique identifier, the peer that it's come from, and then an NS URL of where iOS has actually put that file. iOS will put the file in a temporary location. So Apple recommends that you actually do a copy to a location which you control. Um, I believe it puts it somewhere in the documents directory, but it's somewhere under the uh, app bundles temporary files. So just use a, an NS file manager and copy it to somewhere that you are in control of, somewhere within the documents directory. Um, otherwise, you could lose access to that file if app crashes, app closes, and the temporary files get cleaned through other iOS processes. So lastly, we've got streams. Now, I haven't done a lot with streams. I started playing around with um, doing camera capture and trying to send images at 25 frames a second down a stream. That was interesting. So if anyone uh, has any experience with video capture and then streaming to a file, come and see me because I've got some questions. Um, but basically, uh, really, really straightforward. Again, you specify a single peer to stream to. It'd be really nice if you could do one to many but it's just one at a time. And you send it a stream with a name. It's, in this case, it's an NS output stream. So anything that you can usually stream to an NS output stream, um, which is normally NS data anyway, um, works really well this way. And then on the other end, you get a delegate callback in which you get an in, a reference to an input stream, that stream name and the peer it's coming from. Then you can deal with it on the other end. Um, there's one more way you can set this all up with the delegate, with the uh, advertiser and the browser, where you can do most of it programmatically. Now, there's for advertising, the MC Nearby Service Advertiser class is not very different to the assistant. I'm not quite sure why, but you initialize it exactly the same. Apple just recommends you use this instead of the assistant when you're doing programmatic browsing, which is this. So the Apple provided uh, view controller is nice, but it may not fit within the theme of your app. So you might want to do a custom browser type UI for your app, or you might not want to show that at all. You might just want to have your app automatically connect to any device that is with range that's, that's advertising your particular type of service. So with this programmatic browsing code, you can do that. So basically, you initialize the browser and give it your peer name exactly as you did before. Set yourself as develop the delegate and start browsing. You'll get callbacks when uh, browsing fails for some particular reason. Uh, if you find a peer, so in the case where you find a peer, you might want to throw that into an NS mutable array uh, and grab the discovery info and attach it to them somehow. And then you get a callback for every time you lose a peer. So it's just an add remove, and you can track that in your own data structures and update your own table views or how you want to do it. Um, there's someone out there, someone's done a really nice UI for um, drawing into a view these uh, scalable uh, UI view circles. So it does a nice kind of animation. And that's, this is the code that he's used underneath. So I've written a little demo app which is interesting. I wanted to do it last time, but I just didn't get the time, and so I've done it now. Um, I will try and demonstrate the assisted browsing and the assisted um, advertising, because that's by far the easiest. So if I go to the right project. 
We'll look at, I'll show you the app first, that's probably the easiest way. Very, very simple app. Doesn't look pretty, but it works. Um, users click on Get Connected. It presents the MC um, Peer Connectivity View Controller, and it displays all the nearby peers. You've got Done and Cancel buttons. Um, done will come up when you've got connected peers. And then I can send images and send messages to users. So if you did load on that main view controller, um, I grabbed the device's name, I set up an ID for myself, I set up a session, initialize that with the display name. I then um, set myself as the session delegate, and then set up an assistant. And then I start. So start the assistant. So this is on load. As soon as it loads, I'm advertising. When the user clicks the Get Connected button, I initialize a uh, MC browser view controller, set myself as the delegate, and then I present that to the user. The browser itself has two delegate methods, which I didn't cover in the slides, but it's basically one for the done button, one for the cancel button. If you wanted to do anything particular or um, it's a modal presentation thing, so you don't exactly have a segue back. You could uh, create a view controller and give it of type UI browser view controller and not present it modally, and then you can link in here your um, preparing for a prepare segue code in, in these delegate methods if you like. But I'm doing a modal presentation because it seems appropriate. So once your advertiser is up and running, you then have these session delegate methods. So this is the session did change state. And this is for those three states, connected, uh, not connected, and state connecting. So when I get a state connected, I log something to the console, and I update a Boolean, and I update my connected session variable. And I just ensure that the session I get back might be another device's session. So I just ensure that I'm still linked to the delegate. And then I nullify those when I know I'm not connected or I'm in the connecting state. So once that's done, a user will type in a little text message and they'll hit send, and I'll get a callback from the session saying, did receive data, did receive data from peer. Uh, this is pretty much the same code as you saw up there. It's data message, and all I'm doing here is I'm appending it to a UI text view. Um, these delegate methods, and this isn't something I've come across before, but um, the delegate callbacks aren't going to necessarily be on the main thread, so it's normally best practice to make sure they are performed on the main thread if you are doing UI updates. Uh, I was told by Adam yesterday that there's an easy way of doing this and perform selector and you just use um, GCD, get main queue, and then call a block. But I could call a selector within a block because I'm reusing this append string to message box code, but I just found this easier. So basically, yes, yeah, so that's receiving a message. It's really, really straightforward. Um, resources, it's a little more complicated. And I have it implemented here. Oh, did finish, yes. Now this only somewhat works because I was playing around with uh, the different types of files I could send. I started with JPEG images, it didn't like that. I moved on to some binary files, didn't like that. I got it to work with a text file and with an HTML file, exactly what the Apple uh, little logo on the uh, slideshow showed, so at least that's correct. Um, I'll update the comments when I find out exactly what other file formats you can actually send. I'm surprised they actually matter. Um, so yeah, you, I'm grabbing a, so this is did finish, so I've just received a resource. I'm getting the path from my documents directory I'm turning that into a URL, and then I'm doing a copy with the file manager from the temporary location, the uh, local URL location you can see here that I get provided, and then I'm doing a copy to somewhere that I control, in this case, it's the documents directory, and um, now I present that in my own view controller. So, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go get connected on this one, and now I have an iPhone here. Trusty iPhone 5S. <laughs> I'll launch the app and I'll say get connected. Come on. 
I can see iPhone simulator on mine. So I'm going to do, um, hey, there you go, Tim's iPhone. So I'm going to click on the iPhone simulator on my phone, and we get a nice little prompt. If the user hits declined, then I get a declined message on my phone, and this just keeps happily browsing. So if I try again, I click iPhone simulator, and I click accept this time, because I want this to work. Um, this is over Wi-Fi. Uh, connects really fast, comes up connected, yay. Done button on greys, and I'm all good. So now what I can do is I can go to my little message send box and say, Hello, hello, dev world. Send, bang. Nice and fast, nice and responsive. I first used alert messages to send this, and, I, and it was taking up to 10 or 12 seconds for the, the alert box to appear. And so I started logging it out, and I realized, hang on, the message is actually getting received a lot faster than this alert box is coming in. So it was obviously down to how Apple were queuing up the alerts. They obviously wait for a certain time slot to present it to the user or some kind of other state change. So that was really unusual. And that was on the devices and on the simulator. So Yes, I did. That's probably why. That's probably why. So what, you just spawned off to another thread and run it in a block somewhere? Yeah, well, it was on the main thread. No, no, it was on the main thread. Which is unusual. Yeah, it makes sense. It'd have to be on the main thread. But um, yeah, I, I don't understand it. So yeah, we can we can send messages. Yep, demo, demo, we're done. All right. Uh, there's one other cool thing that I really, really like about this. Say you have one phone and it's got Wi-Fi turned on, just Wi-Fi. You've got a second phone that only has Bluetooth. M most people know that this isn't going to work. You can't talk between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi because they're completely different technologies, different standards. Say you had a third device that had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Two Wi-Fi devices um, were on the same infrastructure network. They've got to be connected to the same access point. You know that these can talk, but the framework allows us to do that. We can now have a Wi-Fi device talking to a Bluetooth device through an intermediary device. Because this is a multi-peer connectivity framework, they share the one session and they all become members of the one session. Uh, because Apple is doing this all for us, um, we can just accept, okay, there's a peer in this session, I can send them, I don't have to worry about the technology or anything like that. So this kind of situation is great if, say, two friends are at uh, someone's house, they've got the Wi-Fi turned on, a third friend comes and joins them, they don't have the Wi-Fi password, but they do have their Bluetooth turned on. So without even having to think about it, it just works. So, um, let's do another demo. Now I have here a second iPhone. Not a 5S this time. It, it's just a 5, it's just a 5. Um, just, just a 5. Um, so what I'm going to do, see I look late because I'm, I'm using that shortcut now and it's getting recorded. Thanks Lewis. Um, Um, we'll run this one, and because the simulator only supports Wi-Fi, um, I'm only going to have Wi-Fi turned on. On my presenting phone here, I've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and on my second phone, I've only got Bluetooth. So if I give that to somebody, somebody? Thank you. Confirm, <laughs> can, I want it back, I want it back. Confirm for me that only Bluetooth is turned on on that device. Yep. And I own Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on that one. Yep, using nice little control center. So, <laughs> if you, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Load up the app and hit get connected. And I'll do the same. Hopefully we see 
Well, we should be. Now, that's Tim's dev phone, and this is Tim's phone, and the simulator is the simulator. And because the simulator is the simulator, it's being brilliant. So the simulator can only see Tim's iPhone, which is this one. These two are both on Wi-Fi. You should only be able to see Tim's dev phone. Is that correct? Yes. So if I click on, uh, hang on, if you click on my phone, if you tap on it, is it saying, does it say connecting? I've got a prompt to accept, so I'll say accept. And on the simulator, I'll say Tim's iPhone, which is also this device. We'll get there eventually. There's two entries, ah, cool. It's the second entry in that list. It's doubled up the peers, probably because of an old one. But I've got now a prompt here. So if I click accept, you should now have two devices listed under connected. And so do I, and so does the simulator. That top iPhone will say declined in a minute because it times out. But now over two different technologies, we've got three devices connected. Now with three devices, to connect three devices together, you'd need three connections, yeah? A to B, B to C, C to A. Well, we only did two. So there's only two connections that we need to do. So if I go to the simulator here and I type in, uh, hello, dev world. You can see that on your device. I can see it on the simulator and I can also see it on my device. Because I specified the whole array of peers, yay, that works. Yay. So in terms of, um, oh, very, very clever. <laughs> yeah, we got there, cool. Um, bug. Um, in terms of making this work with games, the message sending is really, really good because you just need to send game status around. It's fast, it's quick, it's responsive, and it's multi. So you don't have to worry about who has what. You can just broadcast stuff and it just works. And so, with that being somewhat successful, it goes back a slide like that. That is the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Has anybody got any questions? Nope? Yeah. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Stupid questions are good questions. Because if you ask it, someone else has got it. <laughs> oh dear. Um, not for this. Not, not this framework, basically. This framework is for the um, nearby networking. Yeah. So, yeah, within a room or so. Same Wi-Fi network, same sort of Bluetooth domain. Bluetooth, you'd probably get a room or two away. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to go more global, you'd look at the game kit stuff yeah. that allows you to do multi-player multi, multi um, player over the internet. Yes, that's the other thing. Because if you wanted to do a non-game app, that's exactly. And you've got to use core Bluetooth as well, which I'm sure Louis is going to say something about. Shoot. Um, would you say that being able to go to the same thing that? It didn't, no. Normally you'd need three. Yeah, so how does the intermediate It uses the intermediate tree device. Mm -hmm. uh, how secure is that to go via intermediate device if all your stuff's being done via that device? I thought I'd be pushed for time, so I left out the security type section. But I can I can talk about that for a bit. In terms of chaining devices, um, because we're in a hotel and we've got what's called an ESS ID or a multi-access point wireless network, it'd work on the wireless between devices, straight to point. Yeah, because we're on the one wireless network. Could we have a more level, we could. Uh, yes, we could. That'd be awesome. We've got to try that. Next. Um, in terms of chaining devices together, um, 
you could. They have to be quite far apart um, because you'd have to, you do Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. That's how you'd have to do it. You'd have two devices either side on the same Wi-Fi network and then on either side on different Wi-Fi network. So you'd then, to get out of range of one Wi-Fi network to connect to another, you'd have to have a different Bluetooth and some out. Yeah, that'd be weird, but it, but it's I bet it's doable and I want to try it. <laughs> You've intrigued me now. Oh, no, you set up personal hotspots on the phones. That's how you do it. Personal hotspot and Bluetooth. And you, can you connect a phone to a personal hotspot, anyone? Yeah. Yeah? yeah, yeah. No, oh, because you can do an iPad to a personal hotspot. That's cool because you don't ever have to have two. Two either, yeah. if you chain them, yeah. So we're going to try that. Um, <laughs> what was the other question? Ah, security. Um, the framework is great. I'll, we can cut this bit out of the recording just for your interest because I will show you the Apple slides. Because I've got some time to kill on as well. Nope, not that one. 700. Yes, they're in bloody numbers and it gives me shit. Yeah, here we go. Um, basically, you can. Um, so you can do authentication and encryption, uh, and it's no. There's quite a bit of developer setup you got to do. You authenticate with an identity, and you've got to sign that identity. You've got to have a significant reference. You have a security chain, and then you chain it together, and they handle it all. I mean. Um, no, it uses the device self-signed certificate. <laughs> it's probably it's it's probably. It it always is, and, and people do it. But you don't have to. Um, you can upload your own certificate if you like. But using the device's certificate that the device uses to talk to Apple anyway is probably how it does it. It just needs to be some kind of authority on it. But basically, you've got three levels of encryption. There's a negotiation process that happens. So uh, you've got none, you've got optional and required. So optional is if uh, both are in optional or one is optional, one is required, it'll use re encryption. If it's required, it'll both use it. Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's, um, so it's not it's, you have to do it yourself, but at least it's there and you don't need to bring up your own AES encryption library and pull that into your app and do your own socket level encryption and your own NS data encryption and put stuff into character arrays and stuff like that. Just This is so much easier. Um, the documents on this are all pretty good, so um, I suggest looking into that. If you are worried, I mean, it's a, if, say you're writing a game or a little messaging app, are you really going to be concerned about the security of people standing relatively close to each other? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry. but. If you were sending um, identifying data between devices, yeah, I probably would. I probably would. It's people are so paranoid about security nowadays. If you can, and if you can make it as a nice security, if you can put it as a nice feature, you'll see. Ah, oh, secure communication between the devices. You might have just won a user, so it's worth doing. But the whole certificates thing, yeah, it, that that can be complicated. That can be complicated. Yes. No. Um, I think I'm. I'm pretty sure the AirDrop requires the same. Does AirDrop can it create an ad hoc? Yeah, it does. Okay. It sets up, it sets up a, a very temporary. Okay, that's interesting. Because does it, if you are connected to uh, an enterprise network and you've got another device that isn't, can you airdrop to that device yeah. and maintain connectivity to the enterprise? That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds like Apple have written some kind of, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, no, I tested it. I tested it. If, you're, if you just have the Wi-Fi turned on but not connected, it won't. 
Uh, simulator and a phone, to tell you the truth. Turn, just disconnect, just um, turn Wi-Fi on, make sure it doesn't connect to ridges. Yeah. And I'll do the same. Uh, kill the app and um, restart it again. Uh, let's get this network. On but not connected. And turn off Bluetooth. And yeah, turn off Bluetooth, otherwise this obviously isn't going to work. Uh, make sure, make sure the demo app's killed, and we'll start a new for a new session. So Bluetooth, Bluetooth off, Wi-Fi is on, but not connected. Cool. Hit get connected. Yeah, works. So there you go. That's nice. That's actually really nice. So let me just test my theory. Kill the app and start again. I'll connect the ridges. Need my password again. Hopefully. Okay, launch the app again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm connected and you're not, and they still find each other. So yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same kind of technology. That's nice. That's really nice. I'm impressed. Even more so. That's cool. So, yeah, any other questions? Cool, thank you very much. Oh yeah, go on, go on, go on. Wi-Fi, yeah. You could, but with that kind of system, particularly because it's static, yeah. it'd lend itself to a, a proper server client architecture. So you get all your patient monitors to check into a server and then use your client to ad hoc connect to the server. This is much more of a, um, a mobile or a highly mobile ad hoc type device connection. Yeah, this is great because it just works, but your particularly with those monitoring devices, because they don't move. Okay, well they do move, but if they're connected to Wi-Fi, they're still static in terms of their use. If they just keep reporting in the data to a server somewhere, um, you should simply just be able to connect your client into that server. That kind of, see the whole distributed ad hoc client server type uh, models, there are different deployments. so. If those monitors don't handle their own internal data storage, they need to put it somewhere. If the Wi-Fi drops off or you need to reboot your Mac or something like that, you're going to potentially lose data. So, and that kind of data is obviously quite uh, important. So you're going to want a consistent server connection for it to, to connect to. So it's, it's all about the application of the ad hoc technologies. This kind of thing works great for games and just easy social stuff because it's not critical. Depends on how reliable you want the system to be. Could uh, you could also true? Would it still be a local deal? Would it? Um, they'd still be they'd still be there, and they just want to be able to listen in. Yeah, you, you could use this kind of technology. 
uh, you can't do it one to many. So you'd probably be in that case, you'd want to set up a socket and make it stream on multicast. Um, the messages, because it's only a small amount of data, I'd hope that Apple are using a multicast underneath, but that's possibly not the case. They're just doing unicast, bang, 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 rather than, particularly with streaming audio, for telephony, for voice, for music on hold, for all that kind of stuff, the, the multi, multicasting works great. It's efficient, and effectively the networking infrastructure will um, split and deliver the signal for you. Um, so that kind of thing, if you wanted to do it over IP, yeah, you'd do multicast. Definitely. So yes, thank you everyone for coming along. I had a, I had a decent attendance. <laughs>